Hello, and welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Yay! I'm done with finals. That means I can get back to doing these videos on some vague resemblance of a regular schedule again. But also, boo, because I have had finals and other classes, which means I haven't had the time to actually put together a proper review of a book or something similar. So, um... I know. Let's do a list. I haven't done one of those on this show for a while. Yes, I know E3 is this week, and yes, I know that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. Normally, I do a in-depth analysis of the press briefings, but I've had finals, and I've had to study for finals. I had a big course load this year, term, well, year in general, so get off my back. In a polite and civil fashion. What I'll say is chill, daddy -o. Because we're doing a list. I'm doing a list about something cool. As you may know, I'm passionate about speculative fiction. As you may also know, I'm passionate about video games. What you may not know, but may have guessed by various references I've dropped, is I'm also passionate about tabletop role-playing games. I've been playing tabletop role-playing games for almost as long as I've been playing video games. I might be playing, might have played video games or started playing video games sooner, but not that much sooner. But this leads me to one of the frustrations I have when people in the games press talk about tabletop video games. Most video game journalists, because they spend so much time playing video games at work and all of the travel and stuff that they have in their schedule for going to the offices of game studios for previews and all this, that, and the other thing, and having to go to lots of conferences. Um, long story short, a lot of them don't play tabletop games. They may never play tabletop games. They may have some passing knowledge. They may have played them in college or known people who played them. But they're not particularly informed on what the genre, what the, not genre, what the medium has to offer, what the industry has to offer, and what exists there. And consequently, when the games, games journalists tend to discuss tabletop role-playing games, long story short, they're knowledge begins and ends with Dungeons & Dragons, and specifically it begins and ends with, with whatever version of Dungeons & Dragons they have that came out in college. When they were in college, or... yeah. And... basically, once they got out of college, it ceased to exist for them. Um, it's a situation where it, when a new edition of Dungeons & Dragons comes out, like when 4th edition came out, one of the things I occasionally heard from... Um, Game journalist was, oh, that people they still make that. I thought they didn't make that anymore. This also leads to another side thing of normally game journalists know that when people who post in the comments, while some of them be favorable and positive, and we have some great commenters here, there can also be a lot of haters. And uh, normally, game journalists when it comes to haters about video games, they recognize that not all haters in the comments represent the overall game-playing audience. It doesn't even represent the overall of the hardcore gaming audience. Yet, on a few occasions, I have seen people and observed people at major game publications, some of which are defunct, like 1UP, basically go, oh, I've heard a bunch of negative things online about this game, it must be terrible. When, honestly, it's not hard to find a bunch of people saying ne a bunch of negative things online about every game. Not any game. Every game. Your favorite, no matter what your favorite game is, tabletop, um, role-playing games, or board games, or video games, or card games, or games simply played in the theater of the mind, there is someone online who hates it. They hate your cops and robbers. They hate your let's pretend. So, making that assumption is kind of unreasonable that if someone online hates a game, it must be terrible. There are exceptions to this. Spoonie and Angry Joe, in particular, are some of the most well-informed people talking about video games when it comes to tabletop games, both in the role-playing game and war game variety. Which is awesome. 
And actually, we kind of need more people like that. We need more people in the video game journalist track who are willing to go, okay, I'm willing to spend a little less time at PAX, for example, on the video game track to check out the role-playing game track, to go over there, sit down, and play something new. Like, completely new. That is n that is not a video game related in any way. It's, like, sit down, sit down, play Arkham Horror. Sit down and play Catan, Carcassonne. Um, something like that. Hell, sit down and play Go. I mean, not Go, something... We get my drift, though. Um, so, this video, though, is not for the people like Spoonie and Angry Joe, who know a lot about role-playing games and know a lot about video games. No, this is for people who are... who know that tabletop games exist, who also play a lot of video games, and would like to try get into tabletop games. I want to get into something other than just Dungeons & Dragons. I'll, I'll talk about some D&D-ish and D&D-like stuff in this video. Um, I'm looking for people, or I'm aiming this video for people who want to expand their horizons and see what is there to tabletop role-playing games outside of just D&D. So today, I'm going to give six role-playing games that you may like if you enjoy certain other video games. Think of this essay if you like X, you may like Y recommendation. I'm not going to be covering, like, video games that have role-playing game conversions, or other role-playing games that have video game conversions. Um, actually, yeah, kind of both. I'm, if you like World of Warcraft, there's a World of Warcraft tabletop role-playing game that's already out. I think it's out of print, but it's not hard to find copies of it. Similarly, if a game, tabletop game has gotten a conversion to a video game or computer game format, I'm not going to cover that. If you liked Knights of the Old Republic for the Xbox 360, actually, you know what? Let's just do a straight-up scrolling list, like from the old television commercials for records. You remember those, right? Or those big Time Life CD box sets. We're just going to do that and run down this nice long list of m most of the notable tabletop games that have gotten the video game treatments in some form or another. Once we've gone through that, we'll then get back to the main list. So, let's play that. Before I get started, I'm going to be only be covering again six games. That doesn't mean that these are the only role-playing games you'll enjoy, and these are the only role-playing games where there's a video game connection, or if you like a particular video game, this is a role-playing game. You know what I mean? There's a broader horizon. I could honestly do a video that is that is 24 hours long, just talking about tabletop role-playing games and what games you might enjoy if you like other um, certain video games, and so forth and so on. So, consider this a primer. This is a way. This is just a way to just go in, get your feet wet. We'll be sticking to games, both in the video game variety and tabletop game variety, where there's stuff that's in print. There are older games that would fit these just as well, some of which are out of print, but I want something that you can find fairly easily. Now, let's say there's an older version that you can get as a PDF, I'll mention that too, but anyway, a legal PDF. So let's get started. Oh, by six, I like even numbers. That's what. If you like Final Fantasy Tactics or Tactics Ogre, you may like Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition. Tactical RPGs like Final Fantasy Tactics or Tactics Ogre 
are a lot about what I like to call the combat puzzle. The game presents a combat scenario to the player based on the game's story, and it's up to the player to find out the best way to achieve the battle's objectives without overextending themselves or taking too much time. Well, adventures in Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition are built the same way. Dungeons are designed in the form of linked encounters, each of which are designed as combat puzzles. To even things up in terms of combat and non-combat, the game also uses the concept of the skills challenge, which is a collection of skill checks where player characters work together to resolve a particular problem, with each player telling the DM how their character is using their particular skills to resolve the problem, and players being rewarded for their creativity and ingenuity through modifiers on their skill checks. Now, Wizards of the Coast has already announced the 5th edition of Dungeons & Dragons will be coming out in the not-too-distant future. In fact, there's a like special pack or whatever coming out at Gen Con this year, which gives a big whole look at the rules as they exist now. There's actually even an open playtest going on right now if you want to check it out that way. Well, the nice thing about tabletop RPGs is that the books always work. And no matter what, if the company decides to stop supporting a game line, your books magically don't break. They don't stop working. They still work just fine. And currently, 4th edition is still in print. It's not hard at all to find a copy of the 4th edition books at any tabletop game store, Amazon, um, hell, probably there's still stocking them at Barnes... They are still stocking them at Barnes & Noble. Hobbytown, whatever. So, this is a really good time to check those out, particularly since once the 5th edition starts coming out, uh, some, of these, some of these stores will want to move the old books and make way for the new ones, which means there'll be prices that are going down. There'll be stuff going on sale. So, this is a good time to go with it. And yes, I mentioned that I'm not going to talk much about D&D, but... This is a case where it's a good exception, I think. As it is, if you want to give the rules a test drive, you can get a PDF copy of the Quick Start Rules and a sample adventure called The Keep on the Shadowfell, which you may remember from the Penny Arcade D&D podcast, where it was Gabe, Tycho, and Will Wheaton, and I think Scott Kurtz, yeah, and, and Scott Kurtz, playing at dndclassics.com. I'll have a link to all of these, by the way, at the show note, in the show notes. If you like The Elder Scrolls and related games by Bethesda, you might like RuneQuest. Occasionally, as a fan of tabletop RPGs, I come across a console or computer RPG that isn't based on an existing license, but I can tell what tabletop games they were influenced by. In the case of The Elder Scrolls and RuneQuest, similarities are fairly clean-cut. Both games allow for any character in the game to learn magic, rather than restricting it to a particular class or job or anything like that. Both games also use a skill system where characters increase their ranking in, in a skill by using the skill rather than hitting arbitrary level-up milestones. The main difference, though, is that The Elder Scrolls kind of uses that system in hybrid with a level-up system where your progression in the skills determines what level you are, whereas RuneQuest uses no level system at all. Now, the game has gone through various editions over the years. RuneQuest has had RuneQuest 1, RuneQuest 2, restarted to RuneQuest 1 again, then RuneQuest 2, and now there was another edition in there somewhere, I think it was like between the first two and the second one. It's a little wonky. The current edition is called RuneQuest 6. Um, and so, because of this, it's might be a little tricky finding out which one's the most recent edition. Fortunately, and it's fairly straightforward to find it, the most recent editions are available from drivethroughrpg.com. I say editions because the way the last two editions worked out, kind of the last three, is with the number restart, RuneQuest 1 and 2, were put out by a company called Mongoose, who has also put out various stuff for Dungeons & Dragons, uh, third edition, and they released it under what's called a SRD or, or not system reference, system reference document. That's the term I'm looking for. It's an OGL. Thank you. A open gaming license, which basically means that outside from certain bits of the rules, which are considered and the setting, which are considered trade dress, um, 
you can make as much derivative material as you want, so long as you include the open gaming license at the back, and you don't step on the toes of of the uh, setting dress. And so, of those of those versions, there's actually two available right now. Mongoose's RuneQuest 2 is still available under the title of Legend. And that's available from drive through for 10 bucks as a PDF. And you also get an actual print copy of it from Mongoose's webpage. If, on the other hand, you want the most recent edition of RuneQuest itself, with all the setting and all the related stuff for that, that's a little more expensive. Um, PDF copy of the rules from drive through RPG currently wants $25. The print copy is not out yet. Um, I don't think they're taking pre-orders as of the time this episode is being recorded. Um, the PDF of Legend is currently running, as of this recording, $1. So that's the lowest risk option. If you want something that has some setting with it, um, that you can build off of for whatever campaign you want to do, then I recommend checking out uh, RuneQuest 6. For that matter, some of the old RuneQuest 2 stuff is still available in PDF as well. Six of one, half dozen of the other. And you may also like hex crawls. Hex crawls are less of a role-playing game themselves as a type of campaign. This is what you're actually playing with your friends. The rules are what you use to well, keep track of things. It's the way of making sure that when I go bang, bang, you're dead, you don't go, no, uh-uh, you totally didn't hit me. It basically avoids those schoolyard arguments kind of thing. So, for a hex crawl, basically the way a hex crawl works is you have a vast area, usually demarcated with an with a hex grid or hexagonal grid, showing how this is dividing up into a whole bunch of little manageable chunks. There's usually a few cities or towns or whatever scattered out there to give players, character characters, places to go to interact with people. And you wander around in there, and you explore, and you find things. And maybe in this setting there are various factions who have different needs and requirements to accomplish their goals. So you can end up playing them off against each other, or you can siding one over the other. And if this sounds a lot like Skyrim, yeah, Skyrim, basically, if you like Skyrim, Hexcrawl are perfect for you. Especially, especially with the most recent Elder Scrolls games, if you love just wandering around, and finding stuff, just, like, pointing yourself in a direction, going in a straight line, killing every monster that gets in your way, raiding every dungeon that gets in your way, way, hex crawls are perfect for you, because that is the, almost the essence of the hex crawl. So, that is definitely something I'd recommend if you really like the Elder Scrolls game. If you like Deus Ex, Remember Me, or Syndicate, you may also like Interface Zero. As far as cyberpunk RPGs go, Interface Zero is fairly obscure. I mean, actually, my first pick was going to be R. Telzorian Games Cyberpunk 2020 or Shadowrun, but Shadowrun has a side of urban fantasy that the other, that the video games I'm discussing doesn't have, and most of the books for Cyberpunk are 2020 are out of print. And it doesn't help that there's a more recent edition of Cyberpunk, Cyberpunk Third Edition, which isn't very good, and in particular has the infamous doll art. Spoonie did a discussion of this in one of his Counter Monkey videos. I will put a link down in the show notes to that. Interface Zero, on the other hand, is in print, has a new edition coming out, and it uses a role-playing system I like called Savage Worlds. Savage Worlds is a generic game system. That means, basically, with the core book, you can run pretty much everything, although there are little setting toolkits out there that'll help you adjust the rules and give you ideas how to run a fantasy game with it, or a science fiction game, or a pulp game, or in this case, a cyberpunk game. And the whole idea of Savage Worlds is basically the, the mission statement, if you will, is fast, furious, fun. Is that creating characters is fast, running combats is very fast, skill check, everything is fast and easy to do, even GMing and creating your um the, what's called the GMPCs, or NPCs for the game, is all fairly straightforward and quick to do. And because of this, I think Interface Zero could really do a great job of providing an entertaining cyberpunk role-playing game experience for people whose 
I've never played a tabletop role-playing game, especially a cyberpunk one before. The one little caveat I'd say for this is Savage Worlds uses all the dice. In that the standard set of gaming dice which you can find at Hobby Town or possibly at a bookstore, definitely at a game store, is a four-sided dice, six-sided dice, that's your standard traditional board game dice, um, eight-sided dice, ten-sided dice, and a twelve-sided dice, and a twenty-sided dice. Savage Worlds doesn't use a twenty-sided dice, but it use all, uses all the other ones. So, I mean, some game systems, be it's a six, uh, D6 dice pool, which is what Shadowrun uses, then finding dice is straightforward. You just mine your Yahtzee sets and, or Risk sets, and there you go. Or buy a big thing of six-sided dice from the grocery store, whatever. The point is, six-sided dice are easy to find. The other ones, I'm not going to say they're hard to find, they're really not. There's so many people making them now, it's it's really easy to find them for an affordable price. But there's still the whole issue of... Uh, it, it's not in the places that you go all the time already to get them. But still, it's fun. It's really easy to run. And aside from the dice, which... I'm not going to say they're hard... Again, they're not hard to find, but they're not... You trip the whole trip over them in the grocery store. Easy to find. So there, there's that, but... Honestly, if you're going to be running a role-playing game, you need all those dice anyway. If you like fighting games, you may like Fight. Fight is a tabletop role-playing game which is basically designed for people who want to build their own crazy fighting game story with their friends. It's a game designed to handle all sorts of stories for fighting games and brawlers, from narrative light stuff like Final Fight or Street Fighter II, to the involved but semi-realistic like Def Jam Fight for New York, to the heavily involved and crazy, like Blaze Blue, Tekken, or Mortal Kombat. The game even has you balance your character and his special moves by having you assign your special moves controller inputs. So that way the GM can go, Yeah, no, you can't have this ability because this controller input is absolutely impossible for any human to perform. Yes, technically if you wanted to play a fighting game, you could just play a fighting game. Let's get that out of the way, yeah. On the other hand, though... If you're playing your fighting game, if you're playing... Oh, I'm going to yank one right off the shelf behind me. Oh, let's do... Uh, ooh, this one. If you're playing Street Fighter Cross Tekken... Um, yeah. You're playing the game. You ha It has its story. It has its set endings for being which character you go through the game with. But you're not making your own story. You're not. You're using their characters to tell their story with slight variations depending on which character you're playing as. And you're doing it alone. Really, you're doing it alone. If you have someone join in for story mode, it puts the story... It doesn't go co-op through the story mode. It doesn't have you go through the same story mode path with the other player playing all the people it has in mind for story mode. No, it puts the story on hold for you to play your match. So, it's not like you're, you're creating a story with friends. With Fight, you are making a fighting game story with your friends. You get to create your own characters. You get to set up all the story beats yourself. You get to work together to make something interesting and exciting. And, I mean, technically, yes, there's this program out there called Mugen, which lets you do this as well. But Mugen isn't beginner-friendly. It really isn't. And... Honestly, again, even then, you can't tell the story collaboratively. You, you're, you're telling it on your own and sharing it with other people. It's like writing fanfic. But with Fight, you can tell... You're, you can work together to tell an interesting, exciting story and have fun doing it. If you like Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem, or Amnesia, The Dark Descent, you may like Call of Cthulhu. Now, what all three games have in common is they are all heavily inspired by the works of pulp horror author Howard Phillips Lovecraft. All three games incorporate a system in the rules that reflects the loss of sanity your character faces as they confront all sorts of unnameable and unspeakable horrors. And in the case of Call of Cthulhu and Amnesia, the gameplay style discourages you from confronting these horrors face to face or attacking them because in Amnesia your character just kills himself, and or is killed immediately, pretty much. Or, 
in the case of Call of Cthulhu, it's because, again, you lose large amounts of sanity, and you really can't hope to do much, if any, damage to these monsters. And what makes Call of Cthulhu in particular notable is that, of these games, Call of Cthulhu did it first, by coming out in, I believe, the late 70s, early 80s. Whereas Eternal Darkness came out in the early 2000s, and Amnesia came out, I believe, just last year. Call of Cthulhu is one of the longest-lasting horror role-playing games on the market. Admittedly, horror role, that's kind of specific. Actually, I'd even say it's one of the longest-lasting role-playing games on the market. Really, I mean, yes, Dungeons & Dragons is out there too, but Dungeons & Dragons has had dramatic rules variations over the years. Whereas with Call of Cthulhu, the rules changes from the various editions are relatively minimal. I mean, like, maybe you'd have some problems if you tried to use the use first edition Call of Cthulhu stuff with the current edition, or vice versa. But, honestly, it's not too hard to move stuff back and forth. If you find an old copy of the Masks of Nyarlat Hotep um, campaign, you could probably use that with the current edition. And yes, there's a new version of Masks coming out fairly soon, but if you find the old one, it'll work just as well with the new edition. And at, for that matter, there's a plethora of well-written adventures and full campaigns for Call of Cthulhu that will help you run an exciting, ex entertaining, and terrifying campaign for your friends with a limited to almost non-existent amount of prep work. I would, rec in fact, I'd recommend you check out the campaign I just mentioned, Masks of Nyalat Hotep. Another good one is The Mountains of Madness. One of them is a globe-trotting adventure campaign, which takes you all across the world. Ma and that, that's Masks. Whereas Mountains of Madness is more sort of claustrophobic and remote and isolated in, its, in how it sets up its horror. It's based off the, ma as the uh, At the Mountains of Madness story by H.P. Lovecraft, which also kind of inspired the thing, sort of, in the sense of thing buried in the ice that causes nasty things to happen. But I don't want to spoil too much. I want you to play it. So play it. If you like Demon Souls or Dark Souls, you may like the old school renaissance. So there's a person I know who was part of Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson's original gaming groups. These are the groups where Dungeons and Dragons was created along with the Greyhawk and Blackmoor campaign settings, which were the first campaign settings. And he described D&D, as it was originally played, as fantasy fucking Vietnam. As the game, particularly at lower levels, required players to be very cautious and careful. Danger and certain death lies behind every corner and every door. The sound of scuttling around in a corner could be just rats, or it could be something far, far more deadly. And, oh, even if it is rats, that doesn't mean it's necessarily safe. If you play Dark Souls or Demon Souls, that will be really familiar to you. Certainly, original D&D is something that the creators of Dark Souls, Demon Souls, and their spiritual predecessor, King Sfield, are certainly very familiar with. Indeed, some of the design aesthetics are very similar from um, the original D&D, particularly some of the paintings by, I want to say, David Sutherland, like the the drawing A Paladin in Hell, are in turn informed the design idioms for um, Dark Souls and Demon Souls, particularly the iconic main character, the knight in armor. So, that sense of brutally tough, but fair, dungeon design is a key part of original D&D, and is in turn part of the old school renaissance. So what is the old school renaissance? Well, in the early 2000s, Wizards of the Coast put out Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition, and with it they changed the rule system to what is now known as the D20 system. And basically the way it works is, it worked a lot like D&D, but simplified a lot of the mechanics, decomplicated, which is also means simplified, um, so things like saving throws and skill checks and all the sorts of stuff, and then to encourage other people to put out material for the game besides just them, they created what's called the Open Gaming License, which I talked about previously with RuneScape. And part of this also with the System Reference document. These things 
basically contain the core of D&D. The SRD, System Reference Document, contains the core of the rules, the stats, how skill checks, checks work, some of the monsters and some of the spells, and the OGL basically said, okay, here's what you can do with it, and here's the bits with our trade dress, which are ours. You can't use Odaluke's Flaming Sphere. You can just call it Flaming Sphere. But you can't use a name like Odaluke. You can't use a name like Big B. You can't use Elminster. You can't use the Forgotten Realms, that sort of thing. Beholders are out. All that stuff. And so, with those things, you can basically take the, those D20 rules and run with them. People did. They really did. Like, whole publishers either started up or got a fresh start because the D20 system could be like Mongoose, Green Ronin, um, fuck, there's uh, Paizo. All these publishers, just like, who may have been small time before, but got kicked into high gear because of D20 SRD. Um, there's a company called Kinzer and Company, who published the Knights of the Dare, publish, publishes still the Knights of the Dare Table comic book. Um, Spoonie kind of got his start in there as writing a movie column. And they and they basically put out a sort of parody of Dungeons & Dragons based off a fictitious role-playing game they created in the comic um, called Hackmaster. And it was incredibly successful. Enough so that, because they were using a slightly different version of... Not, rather than using just a straight-up SRD, they li- sort of licensed what's called... Um, licensed the first edition and second edition Dungeons and Dragons rules and mashed them together. Um, when they lost the rights to the, the to their D and D first edition and D and D second edition, they still kept doing Hackmaster, but they changed the rules and they went from a good game with a crappy printing because it was perfect bound and cardboard cover and all that sort of thing. And like my copy of the Hackmaster Player's Handbook is falling apart. They changed to leather bound. High quality paper, just absolutely gorgeous, and they could afford to do this because the D twenty boom and all this stuff was basically given the opening to make this Hackmaster game happen. However, right, as an additional part of this, people recognized, well, we've got these rules here; they're really similar to classic D anD D, and Let's take D and D all the way back. Let's strip away all the cruft, skill systems, everything. Let's take it back to its roots. Make it lean and mean, or in some cases, skinny and pissed. And because in the past we'd have games that were called the fantasy heartbreakers, games where we basically people basically go, let's make D and D, but more so, with more races, more spells, more classes, or that sort of thing. And a lot of people who did that win. Either their game failed and they dropped out of the industry, or when the uh, OGL happened, they jumped in on that and just put out material for D and D, which is great. The open game, the old school Renaissance went. Let's not add more on top. Let's narrow it down. Let's make it. Let, let's go for the old school style kind of play. Let's make it where death is likely, very likely. Where we're putting the fear of God, the fear of the dungeon in particular, back in the players. Where any sound in the dungeon could be, it could be a monster out to kill you, or it could be something harmless. You don't know, you have to be careful. You have to be wary. Every battle you approach has to be fight, fought not rushing in with swords and spells swinging, but with care, caution, and cunning. In other words, it's a return to fantasy fucking Vietnam. If you like Dark Souls, if you like Demon Souls, that style of play should be right up your alley. So, if you like this episode, let me know in the comments. In particular, if you want me to do another one of these, and again, I could do a whole bunch of them. If you want another one, post in the comments, and I'll think about doing one. Additionally, there's a particular game where you want to know, or whether it's a role-playing game, where you want to know what video game is similar, so that you can recommend this game to your friends who you want to get into role-playing, or if you want to get into role-playing and you want people and you want a role-playing game that's similar to a video game you like, they'll help you get in. 
and play something that's similar to your tastes in video games or what have you, again, let me know in the comments. And I'll see you playing another one of these together if we get enough response. And, again, if any of these games I've mentioned today strikes your fancy, I put links to all of the games I've mentioned in this episode in the show notes. Next time, let's get back to book reviews. It's summer vacation. I have time for some reading. So, let's read. See you then. Thank mm-hmm. you.